Is China bad? <laughs> what does China do? So China pegs the yuan renminbi. They fix the value of their currency. They make it go where they want it to go. When their economy wasn't, in fact, their economy is still not doing very well. But a few months ago, last year actually, their economy was doing poorly. They devalued their currency. They lowered the value of their currency on purpose, which affects prices between the United States and them. They tried to lower prices of goods. How do you lessen the impact of tariffs that the United States is putting on? Well, one way to do it is to change the value of your currency, which lets you then sell goods cheaper in the U.S. You lower the U.S. price, we slap a tariff on, well, the price doesn't change that much for us as American consumers because they change the value of their currency. They fix the value of their currency. China also steals intellectual property. They tell you they don't, but you know, there's been a big fight going on with Huawei right now, which is the world's largest cell phone company. It's partly owned by the Chinese government. China for many years did not have business taxes at all because they didn't need to. Every business in China was partly owned by the Chinese government. So they didn't need to tax them. They just took their profits, their share of the profits. But U.S. companies coming to China and European countries coming to China aren't going to let the Chinese government own part of their company. So China had to change their rules, and now they actually have a tax system for businesses because there are these businesses that aren't owned by China. But Huawei is partly owned by the Chinese government. They're a partner with the Chinese government. Chinese government participates in the theft of intellectual property. And they do it outright. If you look at their new stealth fighter, you go, hmm, methinks they got the plan for the F-35. Right? There's a strongly held belief in the U.S. military that China managed to steal the plans for the U.S. F-35 fighter jet which became the new Chinese um, stealth fighter. So, big problem. We invent something new. We have a business secret. China steals it. Why don't we want Huawei operating in the United States? We don't want businesses doing their business through a communications channel which is open to the Chinese government. Simple. China also requires, and that's not just China, lots of countries in the world do, require U.S. companies to have a local partner if they want to operate. So if you want to, if U.S. company wants to start up in China or Japan, they have to have a local partner. We don't require that in the United States. We let international companies come to the United States and just operate here. They don't have to have a local partner. What that means is if you're a U.S. car company or a U.S airplane manufacturer or Airbus, a European airplane manufacturer, when you go to China, you have a Chinese partner. China learns how to build airplanes. Chinese companies learn how to build cars, and then they separate off and start up a competing operation, which isn't based on China figuring out how to do this on their own, but they're learning to do it because they essentially forced us to teach them how to do that thing, whatever that is. Now, here's a beautiful graph. This is the graph of the number of manufacturing jobs in the United States. So if you look at 1940, there's about 9,000, 9 million. That 9,000 means 9 million. About 9 million manufacturing jobs in the United States. World War II, big boom, up through the 50s, 60s, and up to about 1970, we go up to about 19 million manufacturing jobs in the United States. And then you can see that that pretty much levels out, bounces around about 18 million, and then there's a decline in the early 80s, the beginning of the, the Reagan era, there's a decline in manufacturing employment, and then it levels back out and stays more or less level, you know, in that 17 million range. So, A, people blame NAFTA. See the green dot. That's where NAFTA went in. Between the green dot and the red dot, that's the first eight years that NAFTA exists. Hmm. Hard to see any real decline in manufacturing jobs there. What's the red dot, though? 
in the 10 years following the red dot, we lose 5 million manufacturing jobs. We lose almost a third of the manufacturing jobs in the United States. What turns out that that red dot is when the United States got China into the World Trade Organization. And there's been all kinds of studies done that show that that entry of China into the WTO, which was arranged by the United States on their behalf, because they didn't really qualify to get in, so we kind of got them in, that started this barrage of jobs leaving the United States, and we lost 5 million manufacturing jobs in the next 10 years. Not all to China, but that maneuver meant once China's in the WTO, then countries that don't like how China is operating have to complain to the WTO, not directly retaliate against China. So even us, we're not supposed to. We had, when we had a dispute, the United States, U.S. companies own all of the banana plantations in Costa Rica. And you can have a whole course on multinational co corporations and whether they're good for countries, bad for countries, how they work in the world. But suffice it to say that every banana plantation in Costa Rica is owned by an American company. And virtually all of the banana plantations in Central and South America are either owned by a U.S. company or a French company. So the money that's earned by these banana plantations isn't reinvested in Costa Rica or somewhere else in Central and South America. It goes to the U.S. or to Europe. France banned the import of American bananas. Instead of dealing with France directly, we had to go, and Costa Rica didn't, we did because we own the plantations. The U.S. goes to the World Trade Organization, files a complaint against France, we won, and France did what the World Trade Organization told them to do. Fine. What happens if the WTO doesn't do anything, or you ask the WTO to do something? The Obama administration filed a couple of hundred complaints against China while they were in office, and really nothing changes. If they're part of the organization and we play by the rules, how then do we get China to do what we think they should if they don't feel they have to play by the rules. Or they claim that now they're playing by the rules when they really aren't. My little sister used to cheat at Monopoly. And since my parents never believed that she would ever cheat at Monopoly, we never had a fair game of Monopoly because my parents with me so if china says hey we're following every rule and the you on floats and and you know it's all not true well what's the right answer to deal you should also note though that looking at this graph that once we got down the great recession there and during the obama years we had good strong growth right we went from 11 million to 12 and a half million manufacturing jobs. And the Trump administration's continued that little upward shoot there. But we've had 10 years where, we, the last 10 years, where we've actually had growth again in manufacturing jobs. Not necessarily really strong growth, but on the way back up. So again, these stories are always really complex. So are there other ways that countries control trade that we haven't talked about? And the answer is yes. So we've talked about the fact that countries can change their exchange rates. And by changing their exchange rates, they change the prices of imports and exports. And that affects how much we buy and sell from each other. We've talked a little about, little, talked about tariffs. And not even anywhere near the whole story, but enough of the story, hopefully, that you get the idea of how complex these issues are. Countries also do what's called quotas. Remember, we looked at that chart about Korea selling beef. And basically there was, or China buying our beef, where there's a 1% tax for a certain quantity and then a 65% tax if we're above that quantity. We 
do the same thing with goods that are in the United coming into the United States, like beef from Argentina. Canada does the same thing with milk from the U.S. into Canada. A certain portion of that milk has no tariff. And then if we try to import more than a certain amount, then we have to pay a big tax. That's called a quota. A quota is when a country puts a physical limit on how much of something you can bring into their country. And everybody does it. We do it. Every country does it. Countries also have licensing agreements. Sometimes you need to have a license before you can import or export. In fact, most of the time you need to have a license before you can import or export. And Japan was famous for you know, lowering all their tariffs. They were part of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, lowered all their tariffs. And you'd apply for a license to import something into Japan, and it might take five years. Well, whatever you want to import, if it's a cow, five years later, it's dead. If it's a computer, five years later, it's obsolete. They could completely block what came into their country by making it take a really long time for you to get the license. Okay, uh, Health and safety rules. The U.S. is good at doing this. Other countries use this all the time. When there was an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease or mad cow disease in England, we blocked Canadian beef like the Canadian cows were going over to England and partying on vacation and then bringing mad cow disease back to Canada. Okay, We have rules about how thick the leather has to be on imported shoes. So we block stuff coming into the United States, sometimes really because there is a health and safety issue, but sometimes just because we don't want that stuff coming into the United States and we can't think of any way to legitimately do it. So we come up with a health and safety rule that says we can't do this. And then we have these ownership requirements and capital controls. Countries limit, not the United States, but most other countries, limit who can own businesses in their countries, and they require partners. When Ford bought Mazda, they could only buy half of Mazda. The rest of Mazda was owned by people from Japan. Nissan is an exception to this. Nissan was going bankrupt, and the Chinese, or sorry, the Japanese government let a French company, Renault, buy Nissan. That was the first time that a foreign company had been allowed to buy the majority of a Japanese domestic company, and they only did it because they needed to save Nissan from going bankrupt. So Nissan is now part of this Renault group, which is the third or fourth largest car company in the world. You just probably, we don't, Renault doesn't sell. They used to sell cars in the United States. They don't sell cars in the United States anymore. So most Americans don't know who they are, but they're actually the owners of Nissan. So we, we see this stuff all the time, right? We may have talked about this. We may not have talked about this, but you know, BMW owns, owns Rolls-Royce and the Indian company Tata owns Jaguar and Volvo is owned by a Chinese company and so on, that there's all of these ownership deals going on where you may think a car company is, you know, a German car company or a French car company or something, and they turn out that they're actually owned by uh, somebody else. So we have all these ownership requirement things going on, and countries limit the ability of companies and people in their country to take the money out of their country. So if you're Brazil, you want rich Brazilians to keep their money inside Brazil and invest it in Brazil, so you make it difficult for them to take money out of the country and invest money out of their country so that they'll have an incentive to invest it inside their country. Okay? So countries have wide-ranging systems of how they m manipulate trade. And even though the United States says we don't do it, we do it all the time, other countries do it in different ways, or the same way we do it. Exchange rates, tariffs, those are the two big, but then there's quotas, licensing, health, ownership requirements. Okay.